Welcome back. Practice Underwater Friday. George just told me off air he has some words ready. I, I have know. words? Yeah, that's what you said. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Actually, I felt like this one was more mild. I think the five op startup from last episode definitely got me a lot more than anything in this part. Okay, good. All right, so it's a little more tame. That's a, that's a good sign. Um, so if you haven't listened to the part one, please go back and listen to Dane. We're going to hear an ad, and then we're going to jump right in. I was just sitting down to record some of my experiences with Dennis Advisors to share with you when I got a call from a good friend of mine who has a ton of financial questions and is uncertain about the future, has some money, he invested it at a time when the market was uncertain and saw some returns. But now he's uncertain of what he should do with that money in order to protect it moving forward and continue to grow it. So I told him, we've been talking about Dennis Advisors for a long time and he knows and trusts them. It's like, this is the perfect time to engage in a full relationship with Dennis Advisors. When the markets are up and down, when you don't know what to do with your money, this is when you need a financial advisor so that you can stop worrying and start living the life that you want to live right now. So do what I did this week, which was have my first call with dentist advisors. Now, not only do I have a plan for myself, but I have a team who's going to help me evaluate the key areas of my financial health every month and help me build and adjust my plan as circumstances change. So if you're ready to have a custom plan built for you, and direct access to an advisor in these uncertain times, go to DentistAdvisors.com and click the book free consultation button to sign up for a call. Once again, go to DentistAdvisors.com and click the book a free consultation link today. Okay, we are back with Dane, the great Dane. (laughs) How are you today? Just kidding, it's the same day we recorded last time. So if he was good then, I guess he's still good. Excellent. I scared him off. <laughs> Good. Um, so a quick recap for Dane's story. He and his partner opened up a startup in February of 2020. So it's been about eight months, minus a couple months, um, a hiatus for COVID. Um, they've had great growth in their first, you know, less than a year. They're seeing 60 to 70 new patients a month. They're collecting about 60K a month, um, doing a, a kind of split shifted model where one of them is there in the morning one is at there at night uh, we talked to dane last time uh, a lot about marketing a lot about um eventually leaving his associate job you know leaving nest actually seeing this fully through um and yeah i had a really good talk so if you haven't listened to the last episode please please jump back um so dane where would you like to start and, and get into uh so you have access to um our dashboard mm-hmm. um yeah, so I think that we're fairly new to this. Uh, why don't you tell me what you see when you're looking at the dashboard um, and see if you see any pitfalls, any things that we need to improve on? Uh, yeah, analyze it. Sure. I mean, um, definitely really clean. You know, that's my first takeaway. Uh, very doing a lot of things right, which I'll get into specifically. Cool. Thank you. Um, what, what year did you graduate dental school? Great question. 12. And then I did a residency. Okay, good. Um, you know, the first thing that jumps out is a, a lot of different clinical offerings, which is nice. Like you mentioned, that's what you wanted your practice to be. And it shows in the numbers. You're offering a bunch of, is, are you doing Invisalign? Are you doing a different clear liner? Invisalign, uh, my partner does more than that. I do. I'm not super experienced with it. Okay. Do you guys have an iTero? We do not. Or some kind? Yeah. That's, that's an area to get into. Um, and yeah, offering, you know, different implant treatments. You guys do a, a lot of fillings versus crowns. Is that due to like a younger population? Or like what's it is a there? super young population. Like probably like yeah. I would say 25 to 35 is the average. Lots of kids that come in that just got dental insurance with their first uh, first job and haven't been to the dentist since like they were on their parents' insurance. Okay. Yeah, Where so do you, you see that? Probably... The fillings to uh, like crowns. So um, if you go to the share practices dashboard, which is in the dashboard lib I, uh, section on the left side. Yep, I got that. You, you click that and we're all the way at the bottom. I got to talk to Rhoda about it. We should be at the top. We're all the way at the bottom. Well, I have um, it like tagged. So you just like stay at the top all the time. Oh, yeah. Good. Um, so yeah, if you go to the treatment acceptance provider tab, 
Uh, and in the bottom right of that tab, it says restoration to crown ratio. Um, looking back, you guys have pretty consistently been, you know, 14 to 18, um, which a lot of, well, maybe a little lower in some other months, maybe around 10, uh, which is still significantly higher than an average. Average would be like five. Okay. Um, so, I mean, like I said, points to a younger patient population, which is why I asked you. Um, but I would just like kind of like day to day check on that to see if it if it's something that you are being a little bit more conservative or or if it really is just you've seen a lot of kids and young adults. Yeah, I think it really is. I don't think either of us are very conservative. If we see a crack, that tooth is recommended to have a crown. Yeah, totally good. And then yeah, I mean, all your your doctor side is really good. You're getting good patient acceptance. You're presenting a lot of treatment. You're having a lot of treatment accepted. Um, you're diagnosing a lot. Like a, a lot of this is, you know, you're seeing mostly new patients right now, yeah. which allows you to kind of see more need than a, than a recall patient. Um, so those numbers are expected to be high, and they are. So honestly, I don't have a lot of, of comments there. I mean, I, I guess the couple questions I have would be to like, um, how have you brought on different specialty procedures? How much do you keep in house? Like, what is your strategies there? We try to keep everything in house that we can. So uh, we both are comfortable with like endo and we try to keep endo in house. Um, we do Invisalign. Uh, I technically place implants. I haven't placed any plants, any implants here. Um, we don't have a cone beam. And so I think that makes me shy, although um, we've chatted with the oral surgeon that we referred to, and he was like, yeah, just send your patients over and I'll send them back. Um, And then like a cone beam would be in our purchase, like future. Um, Is there anything like you're um, not offering because you don't have the stuff for it? Is that holding you back at all, not having the cone beam or... Not having the itero like any no like, so tell me about the itero that's like just uh, the scans and are you using that mostly to show people like hey this is what your teeth would look like if you did invisalign yeah i think i think it especially works well for your practice because um you have a bit more time with each patient because you're still in the younger startup so maybe your schedule isn't so slammed that you could have the ability to scan every new patient who comes in uh even making it like a 75 to 90 minute first visit um yeah i mean that simulator is what sells it like you're able to show the before and after and you know it's not like super exact to this is exactly what it will look like at the end but it gives a general idea which is enough um to the point where i was doing probably one every two or three months and now it's been like nine in the last month and a half okay so it's a definite increase and what does Um, what does the itero run um, so they do a fusion special right now and you have to like, they're, they're such a lame company <laughs> that like, so George got, George got a deal. It was 19,000 for the, the element two, which is like their second from the highest model. And, uh, I presented that to my rep and he's like, oh no, no way do we sell these under 20,000. This will be 25,000 until I sent him the contract of someone else getting it. He was like, oh yeah, that deal. Okay. Yeah. You can get it. Uh, so if you need me to send my contract, I will. Okay. Um, but then they just give you like case minimums. Like you have to do 15 your first year, 18 the second year, 23 in the third year, which is pretty reasonable if you're like actually using it and implementing it to do like a little over case a month. Okay. Um, I think realistically with our new patient flow, we could do that. We have them, our assistant take like full mouth intraoral photos. It's more for... Um, talking about like perio and why it's important to come to your recalls and then any cracked teeth or carries, like obviously we show them, but it'd be nice if we could do that all with um, one scan. Yeah. Especially if you're going to be a bit hamstrung by a younger population, maybe not needing as many crowns as most practices, you know, that's going to be a, uh, an area where production can grow a lot and, you know, obviously great for marketing. Like it, it fits really well with the younger, you know, a lot of like, I have braces as a teenager and now I've stopped wearing my retainer and I've relapsed. Like, I feel like you probably see a bunch of that. You do see a lot of it. Yeah. That would be something I I would, I would get into that before I would do CBCT for you. And also like just the benefit of getting away from the, the PBS, like, ugh, (laughs) gross. 
I don't know. My crowns have way better with the scanner. And I constantly, for months, thought it was like I was a crown prepper or something. Um, do, you, do, you have your, do you have your assistants make your temp crowns? Do you think that they're good temp crowns or do they shift a little bit? No, well, your assistants don't make your crowns currently? Honestly, no. I'm so much faster that with the, I, I'll make the, take the temp impression. Wait, I'll make the temp crown. And then while they're in the BPS quick set for like two minutes, I've already made the temp crown and I know it fits right. And my crowns go on beautifully compared to when my assistants made it. I was like, this doesn't fit. And I was always adjusting their box molds and stuff. Yeah, but wouldn't it be nicer if in that like two or three minutes you were just like sipping some coffee or like, you know, honestly, I, doing something? Honestly, I'm, I'm sitting there already and I'm chit chatting with the patient. It literally takes me two minutes. And no, I think the flow is pretty good. If I had three hygiene to check, which I've had in the past, like, no, then my, my assistant's going to make it. But realistically, when my assistants made it, I had to have like an hour and a half for a crown prep because it took them half an hour to do that. Whereas it literally takes me two minutes. My crown prep is like 50 minutes. Well, see, like you won't, you won't care about that at a point when you're jumping to another room with another assistant seeing another. I will. Like, exactly. Then, you don't care. then, then obviously I'll be like, no, I, I can't do this. So I would say, I would say the thing to add on to that is train them while you're still doing it. I don't think you need to stop doing it. I think you need to show them how to do yeah. it. So when you're ready, they're good to go. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you're one of those, like, do you numb the patient and then you stay there and talk to them a bunch? And okay, no. good. Because like we could, we have nothing to talk about if you are one of those person. <laughs> no, I mean, like, I'm pretty good at shooting it with uh, patients, but yeah, not, yeah, not that good. Not I've got better. I think I'm pretty efficient. Like, I'm pretty good at using my time. So. Uh, I'll go do something else. But the crown thing, like I said, I used to have my assistants do it. And then I went to a different practice where I had time to do it. And I was like, wow, my crowns see a lot better when I make the temp. I think with some training, you won't notice that. Yeah, I think you're probably right too. Okay. So more in the dashboard. Um, is this kind of accurate for your overhead type stuff? Um, that it's like... 30 a month before debt service? So I think that that's pretty accurate. It's been ticking up, but also we've been getting busier and we've had um, a second assistant uh, temp almost always. And then I think that our debt service should be, yeah, our debt service is not in there because uh, Wells Fargo hasn't been taking our money. I don't know what's happening. Oh. Yeah, they're just not taking our money right now. <laughs> what is what is the normal debt service like when it actually starts again so honestly this is really frustrating um we were pre-qualified for like 600k and mm -hmm. we took that all but you have to take it in like a certain amount of time so we actually have two different loans and they're not set to withdraw at the same day so like for three months i've been trying to get them to draw at the same day and like get me what the loan schedule is and they haven't gotten it to me. So I have in my notes that right now it's 2245 and it like steps up in increments. Like that's nine months. Um, but I'm not sure if that's accurate. So is the final resting point like four or 5,000? No. So it like initially it was three months of a hundred dollars. Then it goes to nine months of like, let's say 2,250. Then it goes to 12 payments of like, let's say 4,800. And then it goes to 96 payments of like 7,200. Okay. So 72 is kind of our final number. So I figure like. In like two years, call it, it's got to be 72. Like that's what we're planning on. So maybe call it like 40K a month with debt service is kind of what you're at. Okay. Does that sound about right? It's, it's a little high from like what's left so over our bank high. account, but again, I, I don't think debt service is in there. So maybe 40 K. Okay. Um, so you can see just raising from your kind of 60 ish to maybe more like an 80 is like going to immediately replace any other associate job you had and actually make you take home like a somewhat of a dentist income from this practice. Absolutely. Um, 
So yeah, I would I would look to the Itero, at least talk to a rep, strongly consider that, talk to your partner about it. Okay. And I definitely maybe, will. Maybe one of your next big purchases. Um Next time I look at this, I want to see some nice hygiene info in here because right now, of course, it's empty. Um, yeah. But we've already discussed it, so we know what we're doing there. Um, I mean, you are, you're pre-appointing pretty much everyone, 90%. A typical startup, you're doing a good amount of same-day treatment, which is always good to see. AR, super clean. Um, I did. There's not a lot. I mean, like, you know, being a six, eight months startup is you don't have, you don't have recall really yet. So it's like that number's clean. There's not, a, there's not a ton to see from it. All right. I'm glad that there's not a ton to see from it and not like a bunch of red flags. No, definitely not. I think you found a really good person up front. It seems like like books are super clean. Um, people are scheduling. People are coming back. They're referring people. They're writing a ton of reviews. <laughs> like 135 reviews for a practice that has 400 patients. It's quite a bit of reviews. It's a lot of reviews. We're pretty... We're pretty happy about them. Uh, a patient the other day was like, I didn't want to mention it, but I, you've got like 135 five-star reviews. And I was like, I'm glad you didn't mention it. It makes me nervous. I know that someday we're going to make somebody mad and it's going to go it's gonna go down. But he's like, yeah, but that happens. It does happen. That's, yeah, that's, that's why we pay for Swell and why we try to get that out there because we know it's going to happen. And remember, that's like a, that's a good thing. Having like a couple one stars or even less than five stars, it makes you – feel like it's a real thing you know like people see that and they might not think it's like artificially yeah everyone's saying five stars. You know, give me give me at least a rating that's a little lower yeah i'm fine with that that's fair but it's tough when you do, I, mean, I remember when i got my first first one star it's tough like you feel it yeah i don't know i don't know why we put so much of our like self-worth in what these reviews say but it is yeah, it is funny how like tied to our value, like the patient experiences. And um it's not like it's the most enjoyable place for people. So like you've got to expect that there's gonna be some some bad reviews. Yeah, it's natural. All right, what what else do we need to kind of go through that you want kind of want to leave here with? Questions you have, areas to look into. Honestly, I think that marketing stuff was my biggest questions, and we kind of went over that. Um, how, how is your relationship with your partner like? Uh, I know you mentioned the last it was like a divvying up of things. Yeah. Like, how, how is that with marketing? That's a good thing for like listeners to, to talk to because it sounds like it's all rainbows and butterflies, and it's totally not. Um, we're very close. We're like siblings, um, and this is super high stress thing, and so we have had some major blowout fights where you're like, "Can I work with this person?" We um, have a counselor that we had like established before we even opened the practice. So occasionally we'll um, chat with the counselor about things because, yeah, it's, it's intense. Um, but overall, things are really good. Is that person like a, like a therapist? Yeah, it's a therapist. Like what kind of- yeah. She's, she's actually like a relationship counselor for people with um, – I think like probably marital issues, but she also does business. Oh, that's really, it's really smart that you set that up. Like very, that's really cool. I like that. That was a, uh, that was not our idea. A friend gave us that hour, uh, that idea. Yeah, but no, nice. it's really important um, because there are some things that like, no, you, this is uncharted territory and you're mixing business with friendship and it's really, really hard. Um, and then my partner is, very, very on the ball, very task oriented, like, hey, this, 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 and this. Um, I like the numbers. I like the bigger picture, that sort of stuff. So I think it's a really good compliment that we have, but also it's easy to be like, hey, I'm doing all this stuff. Aaron, what are you doing over there daydreaming? It's like, well, you got to be able to voice those opinions and kind of, um, now we know that like we both got each other's back. We definitely had to divvy up like emails there's like a hundred emails that come in a day and since my partner is so tax oriented she would be like i've got to take care of all those and i was like well you take care of them so quickly that i don't even have the opportunity to take care of them and then it also stresses you out so we've figured out wait, wait that's just like what my mom used to do when i was a kid like i would be something that needs to be done she tell me to do it and then i would just like take my time with it because i didn't want to do it and then she would just or if you were and then she'd be so stressed yeah my mom would do the same and they're like set the table oh you're not doing it right and then she'd like she'd go do it 
So no, figuring out like our ticks and then trying to like divvy up things so that when an email comes through, both of us know, hey, that doesn't have to be answered right now. And actually, I'm the primary person on these topics and you're the primary person on those topics. It's been um, super helpful, but that took a while for us to get there. Yeah, it kind of sounds like you have that classic visionary integrator relationship. You being more the visionary, she's the kind of task oriented, implement, follow the kind of details, day to day type type deal, which is kind of the perfect arrangement. Yeah, there's the there's stuff all the time that I walk in and like the system will be like, oh yeah, doctor um, wants this or that. I'm like, I've never even thought about that. Just whatever you handed me, <laughs> I took. And so no, it's a really good balance. I don't even know the name of this thing you just gave me, but thank you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Like, I'm sure I'll figure out how to use it. But that's cool, though. I, I, I really am super impressed that you that you realized there were things that weren't working about the partnership kind of as you got into it, things you didn't foresee, and uh, brought on an outside professional to handle it. Like, it's it's a lot to be both, you know, really good friends and business partners, and you each have strengths and weaknesses. And, like, you know, the, you're... Your, you know, your practice is so small that it's really meant for kind of one owner, but you're giving up things. And so everyone knows where they need to be and need to be doing. I think, I think people can learn a lot from yeah. that. Um, that's, that's really cool. And it's very humbling. Like she's, she's made me aware of the way that I interact with things. Actually, like you mentioned your mom, I found that with my parents, like most comments would be a dig and like, no, from normal people, that's constructive criticism. And so I take it as a dig and I take it really personally. And so I've learned that like, no, this is just constructive criticism that is not personal. Yeah. It's just what she sees for you is the growth area. Yeah. You know, we, we all have those kind of people in our lives that, that trigger us when they say certain things versus they came from someone else. We'd be like, Oh, thank you for that yeah. reflection. I'm going to work on it. Absolutely. <laughs> um, well, that's good, man. Um, what else? What else do you have? I mean, what else do you have for me? I feel like uh, I came with like the open slate, and actually, I think we've covered like a lot. I don't know. Oh, I have a, yeah, I have a question. So, what's the the longest term vision? Are you seeing? Are you seeing multiple? Are you seeing one maxed out? Like, where where does this end? That's a good question. I don't think that we've uh, determined our endpoint, and I don't think that we'll ever like say, hey, this is our endpoint. I think both of us would like to work fewer days. So in a specific practice, for sure, at some point, we want to bring in associate. Um, I really like clinical dentistry. Uh, my partner, I think she likes clinical dentistry, but she's also realized that she doesn't need it. She could take it or leave it. Um, and so I think we're open to like, hey, build this practice as big as we can, as fast as we can. We're also open to probably buy other practices and try to more or less flip them. I don't think <laughs> I don't think that we could do another startup. It's um, I think startups are very very um, they depend a lot on the practitioner and like I have to be there. I have to be the one that's like giving the best experience to the patient and this and that. And it's just that's not. You can't replicate that very easily. Um, so I don't think a startup is in our future again. So do you see, because like the end version of this practice, it's going to be only one doctor working at a time, um, th whether it's you, your partner, or an associate. You know, three hygienists, there's only really room for one doctor. Yeah. So do you see like, do you see just getting to that point where you know you're going to hit a max, whatever it is, three million, whatever the number is, and just riding that for years? Or do you see staying in growth mode, either new build out, expand next door, or like how, how, how does that go? That's a great question. Honestly, um, I do not mind having a $3 million practice and just using that and practicing dentistry and having like that be my job. And then I come home and I do all the other things that I like to do. That would not be a problem for me at all. Um when we get there, I wouldn't be surprised if I changed my tune because I think that both of us are uh, like to set goals and we like to challenge ourselves and we like to build things. Um, so, yeah. Have you had the, this conversation with her before? I had this conversation with her and I think that both of us are pretty open to both things. Like for sure, we know that, yeah, we don't want to be practicing dentistry five days a week. We probably don't want to be practicing dentistry four days a week. 
uh, when you said, Hey, no, this is like a one, uh, one doctor at a time practice. I have to say that I disagree with that a little bit. I think that, uh, the way we have it set up, we have five ops, but we don't actually have them all equipped. We have, we just equipped the fourth op. The fifth op is more like a surgical suite. And so my partner has extensive experience in like huge full mouth rehab cases. Um, I do a lot of surgery. We're both sedation trained. And so I think realistically, like you can also, the way it's happening right now is like on a Friday that she's working, I'll go in and I'll do a sedation case. And I think realistically, uh, we could have two hygienists, one doctor working out of two rooms, and then we could be in the fifth room doing like these big cases. So that is probably closer to what I think final would be. Gotcha. Yeah, you could have the days where you, you don't have those three hygiene. You save it for a bigger case for one of you. Yeah, two or like and... three hygiene is kind of an evening thing like that we're seeing. Mm-hmm. Like maybe in the mornings, like you're in there doing yeah, the yeah. cases. So I think yeah. that's probably where it could... maxes out. Right. That could totally work. Yeah. Okay, perfect. But we, um, but we still get emails from the, um, the brokers about practices. I think that uh, if I saw like a big like... $1.2 million practice, I would probably, I would be tempted to do that. Do you guys have like periodic, just you and her meetings about like the bigger picture stuff? We try to, um, they've happened fewer and far between just because stuff has been busy. Uh, it's really easy to get bogged down in like the day to day. But yeah, I think that we try to, we're, <laughs> we're supposed to have our annual, um, like meeting and go out to dinner and stuff. So that should be coming up that we can kind of talk about where this is going. I will report back after our conversation about what we've chatted about. Um, and so, yeah, we, we try to have like weekly meetings, but that's usually like day-to-day stuff. It's not visionary. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I would like, I would say either weekly or bi-weekly, just hour long, like, you know, day-to-day type meetings and then a quarterly big picture, maybe half a day, like that's probably a good idea. Like a quarterly yeah. and like, you know, schedule it out just like a patient, like schedule it out. So you have the time booked and yeah. um, you guys need that bigger picture thing, you know, yeah, just to keep you moving in the right direction. That's a good idea. What other questions do you mm-hmm. have? I mean, I, I just like, you know, I was, I was anti partnership for a while. And then I kind of see, I kind of see this kind of arrangement where like you're really good friends, you're similar in age, like your visions are aligned, like how enjoyable that experience can be. Like, yeah, there was some hard points that, you know, some, some disagreements and, and, you know, that kind of thing that can come up, but like the satisfaction when it's not just you, it's someone else too. And like, they have their own strengths, they fill in your weaknesses and um, like clinical skill, like it's a lot to like about this. Um. Yeah, I think coming from like the uh, corporate group, they were all group practices that I came from. I'm like, you definitely see the good side of having partners. Like, yeah, it's really hard. I actually tried, um, I left my corporate job at one point and I became an associate with the intent to like buy in at another job. And uh, I had two bosses. I really loved one and I did not see eye to eye with the other. And the other was one that was closer in my age and that I would be practicing with. And I was like, no way am I going to do this. And so you have to decide, hey, am I fine being a solo person? Which you have to say, like you, you can tell all the listeners, like it's got to be lonely. All those decisions are made on your own. You really don't get to chat about like, a lot of the stuff that's going on in the practice with anybody versus my setup. Like, yeah, it's tough. You don't get all the control, but that's kind of freeing that you don't have all the control. Um, and there are huge disagreements where you're like, Holy shit, are we going to be able to like be partners? Um, but you get through that. Or at least we have, I think we're, we're yeah. lucky. You've got to definitely choose the right person, but there's tons of people that become associates and then buy into a practice with like an older doctor and that seems to work. So as long as you realize like this is a business and this is a partnership, I think it can be done. Yeah. I feel like that's, I feel like that's where it gets at least more difficult, not impossible, but like when it's that older doc who's not quite ready to sell, but like wants to cut back and gives the partnership and then you're inheriting everything he's done for 30 years or she's done. And 
I feel like that's where it gets tougher. But like where yeah. it's like you guys went into this with the same vision. Yeah. And like you're already good friends versus like now I have to force that I like I'm good friends with this old I don't know, this old guy. Like Yeah. No, for sure. Um benefits and pros to each of them. I like the path that we chose. And you're happy you ended up going the startup route? Yeah, I think that like you were talking about our tagline and stuff like that, or like the aesthetic of our clinic and like the overall feel. We would not have gotten that in the other um, practices that we looked at. There was one that we looked at here, and um, it was like the highest producing one. It was in a uh, building that was like basically derelict. Uh, there were not many <laughs> other professionals in there. It was off the street. You couldn't see it. And the bathroom was like a communal bathroom and it had like pink tiles on the wall that was from the seventies. I was like, dude, I expected somebody to be like overdosed on heroin in here. Like that was not for us. We weren't going to pay money for that. And so, yeah, it would have been awesome to buy a $1.2 million practice and like build it and like have that flow going. But realistically, I think that we made some tough decisions. I think they're paying off and we'll get there. Definitely. I mean, and like looking through your pictures, love like the high ceilings, the exposed brick, the kind of like how you have the TV built into this like a little wall that drops down. Yeah, it's called a cloud. That's a breakaway. Oh, it is? Oh, yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Who who advised you on the build out? We did that. We actually, um, my partner went to breakaway. So I had an idea of all that sort of stuff. And in breakaway, they give you uh, some recommendations of how to do the space and how to make clean aesthetic looking things. Um, and then we actually used a non dental builder, um, which was significantly cheaper. And yeah, we had to like, so like a contractor. Yeah, a contractor. And so we, that was hard because we had to kind of hold their hand and we didn't really know what we were doing, but I think it turned out all right. Yeah, totally, man. I mean, I, I would go to this dental office more than I would go to my own. Yeah. That's pretty sure. <laughs> That's funny. And then there were things that like, um, like the waiting area. Well before COVID, I was like, no, we're not having a big waiting area. There can be space for like four people max. Like that is not a space that makes you money. And I see these things on like Facebook. They're like, oh, is my, should I make my office like big for two desks and stuff? Are office is a closet it's like literally a closet because you don't make money there you don't spend any time there so stuff like that that it's like well you've got to think that this is a business and it's made to make money not for you to feel like a big boy at the dentist desk or whatever yeah i mean it's i could see it's small but it has the high ceilings that it's like it feels big enough yeah like, it works I, I wouldn't, we're really happy with it i mean it makes me happy going to work that's good um yeah, I mean, I had I had a root canal on myself uh, yesterday, and the the waiting room couldn't have been bigger than like a hallway. It was literally a hallway, and like, I mean, it didn't take away from anything. I still got the thing done, and it was fine. But who who did your root canal? How did you feel about that? Um, so the endodontist I sent to a couple of towns over did it. Um, I don't know if she's gonna charge me. Like it was kind of like ambiguous because <laughs> it's a two step one. She's got to do the whole like it's from a trauma case on number twenty five. Okay. It uh, had external resorption two years later, and then uh, it's kind of like 50-50 if we're going to save the tooth. So I'd be having to like find someone to get me an implant and this whole deal. So um, we'll see. I don't know. I've had very limited dental work done. And uh, it's funny because I'm like, you know when the patient's acting like a baby and you're like, you're acting like a baby. I, I have a general idea of what the spectrum of emotion is for this. And then when I finally had like my – my cosmetic work done i was like wow this is terrifying i'm actually pretty yeah. nervous <laughs> it's weird like um you're numb but you can feel it if that makes yeah, sense totally. like you can like feel the scraping on the tooth and that drill sound man wow that's crazy that just rings it's just like encompassing right yeah so no <laughs> i i do feel i do feel bad for the patient sometimes <laughs> I mean, my thing was like, it was probably like 30 minutes, but I can't imagine like, you know, an hour and a half for a crown yeah. or something like it is something to go through. Like we do take it for granted how much that yeah. is. And it's funny, like I would say hands down, the most failed appointment that I have is a root canal and um, people have like such bad expectations for root canals. I'm like, 
it is like the quietest procedure that we do. With yeah, my, awesome. yeah, with my little hand piece doing, uh, yeah, rotary. I'm like, this is the quietest, easiest procedure versus like your crown. Yeah, or I mean, I didn't think of that. Like any procedure with not that much drilling is, it would be much easier. Like it was really easy to sit through. It was a lot of just her hand filing and putting solutions in there. But like the the drilling is what the, what's the worst. Did you have complete confidence in the other dentist? Because when I had my work done, I was like, I wish I could do this to myself. Oh, no. I, I don't know if I have confidence in her putting the filling on it when it's done. I think I might want to do that myself. Um, but yeah, no. She's not <laughs> I mean... I mean, it's it's number twenty five. Like I even told her, I was like, you can literally do this in your sleep. Yeah. Like you don't even do. I have the assistant do it. Like you don't even need to do it. <laughs> um. All right. Well, Dane, this was super fun. Like I love chatting. Love your your practice is really amazing. You're on such a good trajectory. Um, everything with your partner was cool, man. I I really, I don't know. I think you're doing so many things right. This is destined for, you know, even bigger success. So thank you for coming. Thanks. On. Awesome. I really appreciate you guys and the help that you give. It is a, uh, it is really hard. A lot of times you feel like you're the only person out there doing this and it's nice to have the community and the insight. Um, and just a second opinion, some eyes, like everything you said, I was kind of like, yeah, that's kind of what we're thinking. It's just, I, I need a little bit more support. I don't want to screw this up. You're not going to, but yeah, I get it. I mean, like you have the ideas, you, you pretty much like a lot. That's what a lot of times happens in these interviews. It's like, they kind of know where, what I'm going to say or what I'm going to, but just like hearing it from someone else, is just what you need. The little like, you know, kick in the butt or whatever it is, or the extra little bit of confidence to actually do it, but happy to help anyway. Good. Man. Good. You were helpful. Thanks. Right. Okay. I hope you guys enjoyed our part two with Dane. George is back. Um, more mild episode in George's words, um, but it got into some cool different concepts that I'm excited to talk about. Yeah, I think we we haven't talked a lot about. So there's a few things I want to touch on. You know, I, I think we'll we'll get some to I guess some kind of smaller points in the beginning, and then I think there's a really cool partnership discussion. Mm-hmm. You know, as you and I are partners, I think it was cool. I don't know for me, I listened to their when he was talking about their partnership. You guys had a great discussion about partnership, mm-hmm. and I I mean I I drew a lot of parallels to our partnership, and so I felt like that would be a cool discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess a couple things that stuck out to me. First of all, I'm not like the startup guy over here. Like I don't want I didn't want anyone to get confused. Um, but yeah, philosophically, I'm not on board with a non dental contractor. Hmm. Why is that? Yeah, I just when it goes well, it goes well and great. You, you, like like he said, it, it is a little cheaper. Um, but they've never done dental, and sometimes they'll put things in the wrong spots, and then you have to either like go back and it, I, I've heard really terrible stories from people that have use somebody that hasn't done dental before. And I, yeah, I think there are some areas in dentistry where you don't need a specialist and like the dental person isn't really needed. I definitely feel like with, um, contracting, building your office. Yeah. Really big on dental contractors. What do you, what do you think are some areas that you don't need a dental specific professional? Hmm. That's a good one. The um, ones that came to mind for me were like painting the office or like, designing the waiting yeah, of course if you're like interior doing design like- stuff yeah, yeah that stuff's easy I'm, I'm talking i think let's zoom out to like non-startup related things yeah you know when would you not need a dental professional i feel like um what was the one that i was thinking about um it i actually yeah, don't I'm, have a dental it i, I like generic it. it okay i don't like dental it um but like the only thing is hipaa and like most it guys know how to deal with that um Repairman's, repairman's going to be a dental specific one. Yeah, it's got to be dental specific. Just don't you go through a supplier. You get a local guy. I suppose um, anything like electrician, plumber it can be non dent, like not dental specific kind of thing. Just yeah, like, usually those guys are not dental specific. Um, yeah. But I feel like accounting. I definitely am really big on a dental mm-hmm. account. Yep, um, agreed. Yeah, I mean maybe financial advising. No, but I feel like even that's like pretty dentist specific. Um, yeah. I can't think of many areas actually that. I would, you know, the specialists can just offer you so much more knowledge and mm-hmm. they're so much, they're worth what they charge, you know? Um, and I, I will not do the generic, like compare this to an endodontist analogy that every other one of these sales guys does where they're like, you know, you, you, you know, you don't go to a GP for a difficult root canal. You go to the endodontist. <laughs> Wait, did I say that? That's a yeah, line that we use? No, it's, it's a line that the, like a specialist in their industry. So I actually have a commercial broker that I work with who's a dental specialist. Rich Andrus, and 
you know, I think he used that line and I was like, okay, like, I'll just, I, I love you, Rich. I'm going to pretend like I didn't hear that one. <laughs> I, love what, I love what's going through their head. They're like, I'm going to use words that this doctor is going to understand. Yeah, they know right. they need to refer difficult root canal to the root canal guy. I'm the real estate guy. <laughs> that is so dumb. Holy crap. Wow. Okay. Uh, so anyway, you know, I, I think, but the one thing that really stuck out to me in this interview, and maybe it's just because it, it pushed my buttons of things that annoy me, but how I, I think in both part one and part two, startups are so doctor dependent at the beginning mm -hmm. and that process of weaning them off of the doctor dependency, man, yeah. <laughs> that's a process. Like, I think that's becoming a thing like the startup hoarding, the startup doctor dependency, the startups doing front desk duties, the startups making temp crowns. Like, I think this is becoming a thing that, because they're so used to doing these functions that normally people delegate, it, then they get like, it becomes part of the workflow and like doing cleanings and all these things, mm -hmm. you know, and then they have a hard time letting go. You know, I think that was something that just stuck out to me a lot. The startup hoarding is just pure mindset, like thinking it's going to fall apart or thinking these good times aren't going to last. So I better just suck it all away in my business account and not, never pay myself like, Oh man, that, that pushes my buttons big time. And well, we, yeah, we've, like, heard, we've heard that now how many times? Yeah, I think I I think I think those tendencies, right? Startup scarcity, startup hoarding, mm -hmm. startup doctor dependency. I think those have been every startup we've had on air. Yeah. And I'm they're not like I mean, this sounds very biased, but I mean those are just factual. That's how our guests have shown up. We are making an observation. If you don't think it's a good one, then that's your judgment, not mine. Um, you know, and so it, the reality is, though, yeah, and like I feel like that, the, like, and like we were talking about last episode, the bigger location, like that's that kind of that mindset comes through a lot. Like it's really scary to open up a practice with no location, with mm -hmm. no patients and a bunch of dead. You know, um, I will, I will challenge everybody. Find me the dentist that went bankrupt because they opened up too big of a practice. Um, the, the the startup that did fail that wasn't too big of a practice. That right? was the four one or five ops. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Gonna fly. That, was our, that was our one cautionary tale. Yeah, not <laughs> gonna fly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, the other kind of minute point I wanted to mention was the uh, ten to fourteen, whatever that was, crown to filling ratio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that to me is a number. If it was five or six to one. I, I would chalk that up to an area demographic or whatever. Mm -hmm. 10 to 14 to 1, that's a lot of fillings for crowns. Yeah, that's <laughs> like a that, lot. That's a lot. Um, you know, I mean, for reference, we are roughly, I've had seven dentists in my practice in two and a half years, and we have all consistently been between two to four. I think we're, most of us are two, between two and three, yeah. you know, and so... Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm under two most months. My associate's probably like two point two. Yeah, I mean, so, we're I mean, we're like two seven. I can't imagine the daily workflow of a ten to one filling the crown. Man, that's a lot of work. Yeah, I mean, and you said one month they were fourteen. Yeah. yeah, that's that's insane. I mean, not insane in like a bad way. I'm not saying that's like insanely bad. To, like diagnose crowns on patients that need more crowns. I'm not. That's not what I'm saying. I think one area could be if you look at their patient acceptance. And you look at who's accepting treatment, they might have a really high filling acceptance and a really mm -hmm. low crown acceptance. Mm -hmm. So then that might be skewing that number. That's an area I'd look if I was Dane. I wouldn't just naturally think I'm not diagnosing enough crowns. Um, but that is an abnormally large number that there is something off, whether it's a case acceptance issue or a diagnosis issue. Um, that there that's too far from the the metrics that everyone else is usually living in. So and that's I, an important point if you're if you're a PBN user that the the filling to crown ratio is um, treatment done, not treatment presented. Yes. So maybe treatment presented, he's falling more in line to like that kind of younger area that he was talking about. Maybe if he mm -hmm. had accepted everything equally, he'd be like a six to one, but maybe he's just not accepting crowns very well. Right. And, you know, and, you know, maybe this, and I don't want to like extrapolate too far, but like we've kind of talked about his scarce mindset and maybe that comes through in him presenting more expensive treatment. Um, you know, so that could potentially be another correlation. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to assume things, um, but that would be something I'd be thinking about. Um, but transitioning to the partnership thing, mm -hmm. I loved, 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 loved that counselor that they have. Yeah. For, Wasn't that cool? Yeah. What a great, you know, I think partnership is, look, I mean, for them, 
it, it seems like the right thing. Mm-hmm. Which I, I mean, for me, I'd have a hard time understanding it, but I, you know, obviously not everyone is us. And I think that on a single office level, it could work. And yeah, it was just cool. It was cool to see it work so well for them. And it was cool to see them like really trying hard to like see a counselor and, and, you know, like really it's like work. a marriage. Man. Yeah. I loved it. That was great. It was so cool. <laughs> No, it, it, I feel like it does add just a, a higher level of enjoyment of everything that you're doing at the office when you have that partner there who like, given that they're similar mindset, like similar vision, you know, th- that whole, everything aligns there. And like, you know, they have some strengths where you're weak kind of thing. Like it just, it can work beautifully, really. Like I'm, I'm starting to see it a lot more now. Well, and I think we see it because of our partnership, right? Right. Yeah. You know, I think we both have the experience of running a business without a partner. And then we have the experience of running a business with a partner. There is that extra level of joy mm-hmm. that comes through when you're doing it together. Uh, I think, but the part that I have a hard time with is for like a single dental office, the amount of income, wealth, and everything I'd be giving up to have a 50% partner, it just, I have a hard time wrapping my mind around that one. I think that's where yeah. I, that's where I have a hard time with it. Yeah, it, it lends itself much more to either the multi-practice or to um, a much larger single office. Like if you mm. if someone was doing a, a 19 up startup like yourself, <laughs> maybe it would make a little more sense. Um, but yeah, with the five op, splitting everything in half, you know, they, as he said, they've they've only been really paying themselves five grand a month, you know, in their first 10 months, eight months open. Um, so it does, you know, cuts in a lot in the single office. Yeah. So I think that for me is that's where I have a hard time with it. If it was like like you said, I think those applications in dentistry make a lot more sense. Um, but they, you know, I mean, I I personally when they were talking about their partnership or when he was talking about their partnership, you know, yeah, I drew a lot of parallels. And it was I I, I do agree that there is a level of enjoyment of what you do that is possible in partnership that I think is hard to get alone. Um, mm-hmm. There is like this level like where you kind of cap out alone, but I think partnership has like this other extra gear that a fun you can have in your business. I even think of like the dental podcast out there where it's just a, just a one person show kind of thing. That's gotta be a lot on one person and, you know, to, to feel like you're, you're doing it all. Um, yeah, it's it, for me, it's just, like you said, added a much higher level of enjoyment that I compared to my own dental office. And I'm like, they're not even the same stratosphere, how much more I enjoy running a business with partner partners in this case, um, than just by myself. For sure. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, so let's so if I'm listening to this episode, you know, and most of our listeners don't have a, you know, business like we do to like kind of run like this and your options are to partner with a dentist to own a practice or multiple practices or to be, do it by yourself. You know, how would you kind of carry this conversation into um, you know, something for our listeners? I think I think it's checking in with yourself and and seeing if you have that entrepreneurial bug to do something like that, to do the multi off multi practice or to do a, a really, really big, you know, high growth model single office with a partner, then it makes sense. If if that's not you, which is fine, I would say join a community like our mastermind where you you mm-hmm. have you feel like you have people on your team now. You have people to share wins, people to go to for support, questions. Um, like find find a group like that is the way I would get like some kind of partnership, um, some benefits of the partnership without actually having one. And I'm pretty big on, so what I, what I always tell people whenever they ask me about partnership is I say like that partner has to bring something that an employee can't. Yeah. And I'm actually pretty big on that still, you know, even in the enjoyment and everything, you know, I think between you, Matt and Richard or me, Matt and Richard, you know, we all bring something that we couldn't hire. And I think that's kind of the goal. And, you know, for, for, if I'm looking at a single office, it has to be something where I feel like I really cannot do this without someone else. And then you bring that person on. And I think they both have to feel that way about each other. And that's when I think it becomes really special. Yeah. And I, I just, you know, the, the older doc bringing on a partner, younger doc, I just, that's, I just <laughs> yeah. don't get it. You made a I great just... point about that with age, unless yeah. there's a pre-planned buyout strategy, right? then they're not really partners. They're just like, it's just a business deal at that point. Yeah. They just want the associates to stay. So they're giving some equity. So to kind of ensure that. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I feel like, you know, if I'm a dentist and listening to this and, you know, I have somebody whose visions align, I feel like that's the one step. Visions have to align. Mm-hmm. 
you have to feel like you can't do it on your own. It's a little bit too big for you to do on your own, the idea or what you're trying mm -hmm. to accomplish. And then you have someone with complementary skill set. I think that's the one thing we haven't touched on. He, she talked about they talked about in the episode. She was the more task oriented person, mm -hmm. and he was the more um, you know visionary integrator. Is the dynamic that they were talking mm -hmm. about. And you have to have co complementary skill sets like that. You cannot have the same skill set. Yeah, and and um, what I was getting into him is important, right? That like weekly meeting, kind of yes. like all right, these are the these are things to check in on, but also setting time for the bigger picture you know, longer meetings once a quarter, however often you want to do them. Like that is super important. Yeah. And for them, you know, because they have a partnership like traction for a startup where they're like eight months in, probably not the most vital thing, No, <laughs> but you know, the structures talked about in traction could really help their partnership. Yeah. So for sure. Something like that would be great. All right. Well, this is fun. This Thank was you for all your thoughts. Yeah, and, and well, Matt's Matt's carrying the load for the rest of the year here, so there's going to be a lot of Matt coming on. I, um, so, uh, you know, enjoy the enjoy the shorter interviews. <laughs> <laughs> they're not shorter, George. They're concise and to the point. Less fluff. Our audience likes when you just dive in. Yes, that is exactly <laughs> what they like. You know them so well, man. I do. I do. I really do. Thirty-six yeah. second intro to, on this. <laughs> Listen, I know the audience because I was one. You weren't really in the audience ever. No. I, I was an audience member. Yeah, and you no. wanted the concise, shorter episode. I wanted the concise. You yes, specifically I... told me you did not like that. <laughs> <laughs> I just specifically remember you saying, I hated this. No, no, episode. no. No, I liked listening to it while I worked out, which my workouts were 45 minutes. So it was so I, that was the time frame I enjoyed. Okay, there you go. <laughs> nice right, guys. <laughs> we'll see everyone next week. Thanks for listening to another episode of Practice Underwater. We'll see you guys next week. If you're interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching with either Dr. George Hariri or Dr. Matt Garino, our contact emails are in the show notes. And if you're interested in being on Practice Underwater as a guest, where we can look at your practice anonymously, you can go ahead and contact the email in the show notes and follow those directions to get on the show. Thanks, and we'll see you guys next week on Practice Underwater.